Alright guys, how's it going? By now the dust has settled on the rise in reviews and it's safe to say that the response has been overwhelmingly positive, but not in every area. So let's start this video with a quick recap on what some in the tech press have been saying about Ryzen. So I'm gonna start over at Tech Power Up and an editorial by Ravenlord which almost brought a tear to my eye. The results really do speak for themselves. AMD's Ryzen are beastly workstation CPUs, pulverizing any competition that Intel has to offer purely in price performance ratio, and it also absolutely trounces, and he means trounces, Intel 6900K and 6950X in any performance per watt scenarios, which is pretty mind blowing stuff given where they were. Gaming however, is another story. And that story is of course what this video is all about. Over at the tech report we see a similar story. Amazing Cinebench performance where all of the Ryzen 7 CPUs are faster than the Haswell 5960X, by quite a distance in fact, and we even see scenarios where the 8 core Ryzen 7 1800X almost beats Intel's 10 core 6950X. That was mostly seen in Handbrake. And over at TechSpot, once again in Cinebench R15, we again see the R7 CPUs laying waste to the Intel 6900K this time. With a similar story in 7-zip and this XL 2016 benchmark was very interesting because I do not remember the last time that AMD led in this benchmark. This benchmark runs calculations on a massive Excel spreadsheet and is a very popular benchmark in the business segment. And here we see the 1800X around 15% faster than the 6900K. But again, once you get to the gaming benchmarks, something seems to have gone wrong, with Ryzen being a long way behind compared to its application performance. So one initial reaction to this might be, well, it's just another bulldozer. Really good in multi-threading, but no good in single thread. But that is simply not the case. While Ryzen is exceptional in multi-threaded scenarios, it is also very, very fast in single threaded scenarios. Bulldozer's IPC and single thread performance was nowhere near this close to the Intel CPUs of that time. Now it is true that Ryzen can't live with CPUs like the 7700K or even the older Haswell 4790K in strictly single threaded performance. And that's all about the clock speeds. But we can clearly see in these applications that it is more than a match for Intel's Broadwell E which really is Ryzen's main competition. So as you can clearly see, there is nothing wrong with Ryzen's single thread performance. It is in fact extremely good. So what's going wrong here? Well, we also know that it's got nothing to do with floating point or integer performance. As you know already, CPUs basically crunch two different types of numbers. Those are integer numbers and floating point numbers. And applications use a mix of these two types of numbers. Stuff like your Blender and your Cinebench those make heavy use of floating point numbers, whereas stuff like Handbrake and a lot of these single threaded apps rely heavily on integer performance. So there's no hardware reason why it's this poor in gaming, because Ryzen is equally impressive in both. CPUs don't have some gaming path that can affect this. Yeah, you've got stuff like SSE and AVX2, but those are not having an effect here. So what is it? Let's take a look at a short explanation over at PC World. Now one game that was very heavily benchmarked was of course Ashes of the Singularity. And as we know, Ashes is very heavily multi-threaded and should have been a really good benchmark for Ryzen. But in actual fact, it fell well behind not only the 6900K, but also Intel 6 core 6800K and 4 core 6700K. So that was a real slam dunk for Intel and completely unexpected. And we've got the same story in Tomb Raider. But it has to be said that the game is running at 1080p normal settings at over 350 frames per second. Once again, Rise of the Tomb Raider, as you might expect, was a very heavily benchmarked game. So what the hell is going on? Well, as PC World tested, at realistic settings, it doesn't matter. Playing Tomb Raider at 1080p on normal settings at 350 frames per second, nobody in their right mind is going to do that you're much more likely to take 150 frames per second on ultra settings instead. Due to the practically imperceptible differences between 350 and 150 frames per second. And here we can quite clearly see that Tomb Raider on Ultimate 1080p shows all of these CPUs performing practically identically at over 170 frames per second. Even the old FX 8370 down the bottom there at almost 175 frames per second. And again, a similar story with Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. 
Now, it's safe to say that anyone spending over $300 on a CPU for gaming, there's a good chance that they're going to be running higher resolution monitors, 1440p, even 4K. And they're certainly going to be wanting ultra settings. So why is the tech press even benchmarking at lower resolution, lower settings? Well, this is the interesting part. And this is the part where the entire tech press is getting it badly, badly wrong. And now I'm going to show you why that is. Near the tail end of 2012, AMD had released their pile driver FX8350 CPU. It was a much better CPU than the really awful FX8150 bulldozer CPU the year earlier. It was, however, still no match, especially in gaming, for a whole slew of Intel CPUs. The comparison at the time, though, was mostly made against Intel's famous i5 2500K, a CPU which very, very many people bought including myself. We can see here that at 1080p, over a whole bunch of games, the 2500K was around 10% faster. 10.4% in actual fact. Over the page, computer base are doing the low resolution benchmarks. In this case, very low resolution of 640 by 480. Now, all of these benchmarks were done using NVIDIA's flagship GTX 680 graphics card. So let's just have a quick explanation of why they're doing this. Although low resolution games do not make any sense at all to the layman, they are an elementary part of the process. Because this is where the true effect of the processor is shown. What they're trying to do is eliminate the graphics card. Because obviously at higher resolutions, the graphics cards can become the limiting factor. Just like we saw at PC World. So the point in doing this is that if you benchmark at low resolution, the results that you see could be true with faster graphics cards at higher resolutions. Now, the fastest graphics card, like I said, was a GTX 680. But theoretically, even faster graphics cards should show results that are more akin to what we see at lower resolution right now. And if we look at this chart, at 480p, the difference has jumped from 10.4% up to 17.2% in favour of the 2500K. So this all makes sense. You want to know how your CPU is going to perform in future. And this is a sensible way to do it. Or so it seems. For some bizarre reason, nobody actually ever put that to the test. Until now. So that was the end of 2012. Fast forward 9 months or so to the middle of 2013. And Intel had just released their Haswell architecture. But we're not interested in that. We're still interested in the 2500K and the 8350. So nine months later or so, and instead of a GTX 680, they are now using a GTX Titan, a graphics card which was around 33% faster than the GTX 680. So given what you've learned, we should expect to see the i5-2500K pulling away, perhaps getting closer to its 17.2% lead that it had at 480p the previous year. But that's not what happened, and in actual fact, the lead at 1080p has fallen from the previous year's 10.4% down to 8.5%. And now if we look at the low resolution results, again at 480p, the previous year's difference of 17.2% in favour of the 2500K is now down to 14.8%, again with the GTX Titan. So faster graphics card, and yet AMD's 8350 has closed the gap in complete opposition to what should have happened. But maybe that was just a fluke. So let's move forward another couple of years, this time to Intel's Broadwell architecture and the release of the i7-5775C. Again, we're not interested in that. We only care about the 2500K and the FX8350. The results, however, were almost identical to the previous test. And on further inspection, I learned that this was because they were still using the same GTX Titan graphics card. So we need to move on even further. To the very beginning of this year, the 3rd of January 2017, and the new KB Lake 7700K. Again though, we're only interested in the 2500K and the FX8370. Now, I want to note here that they have moved to the FX8370 over the FX8350. However, it is a tiny increase in performance. It's only 100 megahertz of turbo, the difference between 4.2 and 4.3 gigahertz which is only around 2% and only when one single thread is loaded. So it really is negligible. And the change in the difference of performance was also negligible, but also down yet again. As the 2500K is now only 8.2% faster than the FX CPU. It is, however, interesting to note that there are one or two pretty old games in here now. Assassin's Creed Unity 
F1 2015. Even Grand Theft Auto 5 is getting on a little bit. Ditto The Witcher 3 and also Total War Attila. So even though they're using a GTX 980 Ti now, most of the games are actually older than the graphics card. But what Computer Base did next was very, very interesting. The week before their Ryzen review, they decided to update their game test bench to modern titles. Now looking at their games, we can quite clearly see that they've added a lot more games and also many more modern titles. And moving on to the Ryzen review, where they are using a GTX Titan X Pascal, the fastest graphics card available today. In these modern titles, the FX8370 is now 10% ahead of the i5-2500K. That was at 1080p. At 720p, the FX is still over 10% ahead. Now think about that. Over the course of four and a half years, Bulldozer was supposed to fall further and further behind Sandy Bridge. But what actually happened was that every year, the gap narrowly closed, even though the graphics cards got progressively faster. Up until this year, where modern games now put FX ahead, by a good distance as well, of the i5-2500K. And yet four years ago, the tech press was benching low resolution, low quality settings, wrongly assuming that this was a good indicator of future gaming performance, when in actual fact the opposite happened. This low resolution gaming crap has never been a good indicator of future performance, but I know what was a good indicator of future performance, and that is of course more CPU threads. And we can see clearly simply by looking at the overall results, because the 6900K now leads over the 6850K. It's not completely multi-threaded though, because the 6950X is behind both of them, even though currently that is the highest core count CPU. So this is not completely multi-threaded games, it's just modern games showing that more cores matters more than faster single threads, because the i7-7700K is actually quite a distance behind all three of those CPUs and Ryzen is only 4% behind. But if it can beat the 6900K in a bunch of applications, why is it even behind at all? So that part is really, really easy. It basically comes down to one simple fact. Ryzen is a grounds up brand new design. There has been nothing like this ever before. This is especially true about the cache and memory subsystem, and also the way that both of the four core blocks communicate with each other. Now, a bunch of extra testing has been done since the reviews, and it was discovered that switching off hyper-threading gives a large boost in most games. This is also true about Intel CPUs. Hardware France also discovered that Windows must be set to high performance mode because it is currently defaulting to balanced mode, but only for Ryzen. Intel CPUs default to high performance mode. And again, on the memory subsystem, there's a lot of stuff here that needs to be optimized. And as I talked about in my last video, there has basically been no optimization done on Ryzen. If any gaming optimizations have been done, it is probably going to be Battlefield 1. Joker, in fact, did some really good benchmarks and other people slammed him for it because supposedly they were all GPU bound. Now on the left here you've got the Ryzen 1700 and on the right the 7700K. Both are overclocked to I believe 4GHz and 4.9GHz respectively. And here in Battlefield 1 you can see similar frame rate and yet it should be obvious that one of these CPUs is almost at its limit and it's not the AMD CPU. And there's something else I want to say about this. I've been reading reviews and watching videos where the language suggests that the Ryzen CPU is the limiting factor. A CPU bottleneck. What you're looking at here is a CPU bottleneck, but that bottleneck is on the i7-7700K because the CPU is almost completely tapped out. The 1700 has got plenty of headroom left. You stick a faster graphics card in there, the 1700 is going to pull away, whereas the 7700 will bottleneck it. In most games, that doesn't show this kind of core scaling. What you're actually talking about is not a CPU bottleneck, it is a programming bottleneck. The simple fact of the matter is, the Ryzen 1700 is a much, much faster CPU than the i7-7700K. It just needs the software to take advantage of it properly. But let's be frank, we've heard that one before. We heard it with Bulldozer, and it took four and a half years. Nobody that bought a 2500K should regret it, and I certainly don't regret purchasing that over the FX. But if you buy a 7700K today, in the belief that it's a better CPU, then I can assure you that you will regret that, and this is why. Even though my Ryzen sample arrived very late, I was still monitoring other reviews very closely, and it became clear to me that the 1080p and lower results were going to be an issue. 
Now, AMD also knew that this was going to be an issue, and they had a response for it. As we presented at Ryzen Tech Day, we are supporting 300 plus developer kits with game development studios to optimize current and future game releases for the all new Ryzen CPU. And they are on track for 1000 plus developer systems in 2017. You may have heard about the tie in with Bethesda, who announced a new relationship with AMD to optimize for Ryzen through using Vulkan. Remember Ashes of the Singularity benchmarks? They are working to scale their existing and future game titles performance to take full advantage of Ryzen and its 8 core 16 thread architecture and the results thus far are impressive, but they're not yet ready for benchmarking. It didn't stop the rest of the press from benchmarking it. Now, the last thing you want to do is throw out results, so I fully understand why the press went ahead with it, but the press also has a duty to you, the viewer, to ensure that you are aware of these facts. And also we can see from Creative Assembly, the developers of Total War Warhammer, they will also be delivering performance updates in order to provide better performance on rising CPUs moving forward. 1000 developer kits guys. You need to think about this, right? We talked about Bulldozer and Sandy Bridge. There's no developer out there using AMD CPUs currently because Bulldozer was crap. So all games that have been developed over the past five or six years have been optimized for Intel CPUs. Even with that, Bulldozer overtook Sandy Bridge. Why do you think that is? It's because this has been AMD's agenda from the start. I talked about it in the master plan video, right at the very end when I said, this isn't about AMD and Nvidia, it's about AMD and Intel. For years now, AMD has put the ecosystem in place, through Mantle to Vulkan, even DX12, so that games can make use of more CPU threads. This is how they beat Intel, because Intel can't afford to sell 8 core CPUs for $300. And now that they've got Ryzen in place, a blazing fast CPU, with incredible performance per watt and even better performance per dollar, the game developers are going to be all over this. And it doesn't end there because these same Zen cores are going into the next generation game consoles. So you're going to be optimizing for PC and console at the same time. I have listened to some crap this week about Ryzen being on par with the i5 in gaming. What a crock of shit. Ryzen is faster than Broadwell E, mostly because of its very good hyper-threading, and there is no reason why game developers won't make use of that, especially on the consoles. The difference this time is, it's not going to take four and a half years. I expect Ryzen to be faster within a year, but the onus is on AMD to ensure that these older games get optimised and not just the games going forward. If AMD has got one big failing, it's that they never look back. There's a bunch of very highly played games out there, stuff like Grand Theft Auto V for example, that is badly in need of AMD optimization, and for some reason they just don't seem to do it. Well they need to do it with Ryzen, instead of looking forward to Grand Theft Auto VI, which will of course undoubtedly be developed for Vulcan. You guys in the press that are watching this, you have got a duty to do the right thing. It should be crystal clear to you that low resolution gaming benchmarks were not a good indicator of future performance, but more threads were. And you should be able to see that AMD has put everything in place to bring this future around. And yet some of your articles and videos have completely ignored all of this, have ignored the fact that Ryzen is brand new, unoptimized, ignored all of the application benchmarks showing Ryzen well ahead and instead decided to zero in on the low resolution benchmarks that are absolutely meaningless to anybody looking to buy a good CPU. As far as you go AMD, I know there's a bunch of you guys at AMD watching this, you're gonna have to deal with this issue you have with the press. The best new CPU that has launched in years and almost to a man they lined up to knock it down because of this stupid low resolution gaming idea which has no basis in reality. The way you win over the rest of the press is with simple facts. You don't need to spin stuff, you don't need to tell them to disable things for Intel, you don't need to tell them to simply bench at 4K, you just need to point out that the low resolution results we see today will be nowhere near an indicator of Ryzen's gaming performance in future. I think it's safe to say that everybody, from AMD to the press, even the consumers who need to start using their brains a bit more, we can all do just that little bit better. I'll catch you later, guys.